Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning and welcome to the launch of our global methane tracker uh, today. Um, we're delighted to host uh, you uh, from the IA headquarters. Uh, we launched the global methane tracker with the latest figures uh, and data plus policy recommendations on how to tackle this very uh, important uh, issue. Uh, we will hear uh, very shortly from our executive director, uh, Dr. Fatih Birol, who will um, uh, give us some introductory remarks. And this will be followed by a presentation from our chief energy economist, uh, Tim Gould. And after that, we'll have an opportunity for some Q&A for the journalists. You can find all the figures um, and the analysis on our website. And with that, I would like to turn it to Dr. Fatih Birol. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mouat, and uh, greetings uh, to uh, all viewers from the International Energy Agency, and welcome to the launch of IES Global Methane uh, Tracker. Dear colleagues, uh, we believe at the IEA that the methane emissions do not always get the attention in the discussion of climate change that it deserves. In fact, there is a disproportionate attention that the uh, methane gets because when we uh, look at the methane's role in the uh, climate change, it's a potent one, uh, first of all, much potent, much more potent than uh, CO2. And the early action on methane can help avoiding the first uh, worst effects of uh, climate change. So therefore, uh, we think uh, tackling methane is among the most important, if not the most important, uh, thing that can be done uh, limit the near-term uh, warming. We were, uh, the IEA was uh, one of the first uh, who appreciated the importance of uh, methane, focus on the uh, methane issues, and it has been in uh, our radar screen for many years. And uh, as of today, the, our methane tracker has become the global reference for data on methane emissions from the energy sector. Our estimates that we have uh, in our website, it can be freely uh, accessed uh, in the tracker, incorporate uh, all the latest insights from the scientific studies, measurement campaigns, uh, and satellite data. We have worked closely with the world's methane science community, and we are grateful for this collaboration. I am confident that uh, in our updated tracker, we have the best available data numbers for methane emissions around the world covering all sources of methane emissions, including oil, gas, coal, and bioenergy. So uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, my uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Mr. Gould and Mr. McGlade, and their teams for uh, putting this methane tracker at the service of the international community. Now, what do our numbers show in the, this year's global, global methane uh, tracker? They show that there is some improvement in terms of uh, methane emissions, but it is not, emissions are not falling fast enough, and not even uh, close to that. And uh, this is uh, happening at a time when we have uh, seen uh, natural gas prices uh, being uh, at very high levels. And our uh, new analysis based on this data shows that well over half of global methane emissions could be reduced at no net cost. Reducing these emissions saves money as well as saving the planet. So we can reduce the emissions uh, by more than 50% at no net cost. I think in terms of economics, in terms of the fight against climate change, this is a very important area that has been ident identified uh, by my colleagues. What about the investments to make this happen? Is the money uh, available? Absolutely, yes. 
We have uh, recently showed our analysis that the global oil and gas industry last year, 2022, their total income was about 4 trillion US dollars. On average, on a normal uh, year, uh, the global oil and gas industry makes about 1.4, 1.5 trillion dollars and it jumped to four trillion uh, dollars and there's a lot of discussion in almost all the countries uh, within the companies uh, governments governments uh, uh, companies citizens what to do with this huge amount of increase in the oil and gas income so uh, some people talk about the uh, dividends investment uh, share uh, buybacks and I made uh, international energy agencies point very clear. We would like to see at least a significant chunk of this four trillion US dollar goes to clean energy technology investment and solutions in emerging uh, countries. Dear colleagues, when I look at the, uh, the excellent analysis uh, carried out by my uh, colleagues, uh, there is one number I wanted to uh, bring to attention which I found very impressive. Only about this 3% of the 4 trillion, as we call it, uh, windfall uh, income, you may call whatever you want, but the money is the same, the 4 trillion, only with this 3% of uh, 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 the 4 trillion, we can cut 75% of global methane emissions. This is an excellent opportunity, which means from our point of view, there is no excuse for oil and gas industry to move uh, quickly and there is no excuse not only for the companies, but for the governments to step in and to make this uh, happen. I believe this issue, I should say, I hope this issue will be uh, one of the key topics to be discussed in the forthcoming COP28 meeting in the United Arab uh, Emirates. Talking about the, uh, the COP28, uh, the uh, colleagues uh, here, I would like to announce a major study that we are going to come up uh, just before COP28 uh, on the oil and gas industry in net zero transitions. As a follow-up of the IEF work, uh, many of them including the work we made uh, one and a half years ago, net zero transition of the global uh, energy sector. And the new study I am announced uh, will uh, look at the, how the oil and gas industry can respond to the challenge of climate change and how we can tell if, if the industry's response is serious whether company actions are compatible with ambitions, climate goals, and the 1.5 degree target. This study being carried out again the, under the able leadership of uh, our chief energy economist, uh, Tim Gould, uh, will uh, analyze the implications of energy transitions for major oil and gas producers, both countries and companies will be analyzed here. The very fact that the COP28 takes place in a key Middle East uh, oil producer, I think uh, is a good choice to bring this report on a timely basis to provide a roadmap for the countries, for the companies who say that, they, that their investment plan, their policies are in line with the Paris targets. 
So, uh, dear colleagues, uh, this report, uh, this major report, uh, we are going to come up uh, right before the COP28 in order to help to frame the discussions there. But now, I would like to pass the floor to my colleague, uh, Mr. Tim Gould, our chief energy economist, who will lead us through some of the findings of our new global methane tracker. Mr. Gould, please. Thank you very much indeed, um, Executive Director. Um, what I'd like to do now is, is talk in a little bit more detail about some of the findings uh, from our new work. Um, but exactly as the Executive Director has said, you know, last year was a year of extraordinary pressure on energy markets. Um, and that's raised all sorts of energy security questions. And it's also raised all sorts of questions about the prospects for global clean energy transitions and reaching our emissions reductions and climate goals. And on both of those fronts, both the energy security front and the climate front, methane has to be front uh, and centre. And it's more important than ever that we see demonstrable signs of change in the level of those emissions. So where are we? Um, as the executive director said, this is our best estimate of where global energy related methane emissions are and we've worked very closely with the methane science community in, in putting uh, these numbers together and there is some some guarded good news in the sense that some of the indicators that we look at um, show uh, evidence of progress so satellite detected large leaks fell by almost 10 percent um, last year relative to 2021 um, and preliminary estimates that we have from our collaboration with the World Bank and, and the Payne Institute show a, a mixed picture on flaring but indeed also some uh, reductions. However, the emissions intensity of global oil and gas production and coal production um, remains far too high uh, and it's not falling fast enough by, by any means. Um, so uh, despite those signs of progress, we, we still estimate that energy related methane emissions rose in, in 2022. And that's discouraging for two reasons. It's discouraging because the incentives, the economic incentives to make those reductions um, were huge last year. Uh, we had record natural gas prices in many markets around the world. So there was an extremely strong economic incentive to bring that methane to market. And of course we also need to be looking at these emissions through the lens of the ever pressing need to tackle uh, climate change. Let's have in mind that methane is responsible for around 30 percent of the observed warming so far. And if we are to get on track for net zero emissions and limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees, Methane emissions from the energy sector, so those bars you're looking at on the screen, um, they need to see a 75% reduction by 2030. So that's a very steep decline um, from where uh, we are today. Now there is momentum in this space and one of the ways to demonstrate that is just to look at the number of new initiatives, the number of new policies uh, that have come in um, across uh, the last few years. So at the international level, um, momentum behind the Global Methane Pledge uh, continues to grow with over 150 countries now um, in the Global Methane Pledge. And over 50 countries have already released national action plans or have begun uh, work on them. Uh, we've seen many countries introduce new regulations for methane um, over the last year. Colombia, Nigeria, uh, two that we've been following particularly closely, a new methane charge uh, was included in the US Inflation Reduction Act and um, continued progress also in the European um, policy discussions. And there's also important signs on the industry side um, where performance is very, very uneven across different uh, companies, but there are some important voluntary industry efforts. Um, last year, the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative announced uh, it's aiming for zero methane emissions. Um, um, initiative which uh, you know we think that that needs to gain momentum uh, and it can be uh, an important factor in the future as well. But now 
is really the time when we need to see much more on the ground action and convert all of those policy and industry initiatives into real uh, deployment. So one of the very promising areas that we've seen in recent years is on the detection and monitoring of, of methane emissions. And I think many people are now aware that satellites and other continuous monitoring systems are providing a huge boost to methane uh, abatement prospects and bringing much needed transparency, particularly for the larger leaks. And for the first time, uh, we've seen satellites detecting methane leaks from offshore areas in 2022. That's always been an area where there's been limited visibility up until now. And that includes the major leak from the Nord Stream pipeline uh, explosion. And different groups are putting that data uh, to good use. We're working closely with the International Methane Emissions Observatory, also known as its IMEO. And, uh, and I would like to thank the IMEO, um, their science teams, as well as um, Kairos and GHGSAT uh, for, the, for the great collaboration and the discussions that we've have been instrumental in helping us bringing together the Global Methane Tracker this year. And one very concrete example of the power of these satellites is their ability to rapidly detect uh, and then help address large leaks. And there's a new initiative called the Methane Alert and Response System, or MARS, which has been put in place by the IMEO, um, that will use those satellite monitoring capabilities to try and identify those super emitting events quickly, notify host countries quickly, um, and operators as well, and then assist uh, governments, companies, and other stakeholders mitigate and, and learn from these events. So there's a very dynamic picture uh, there. And if you look at the super emitting events that we had in 2022, um, we had more than 500 um, in, seen in, in, in 20 countries in 2022. And that includes um, the one at the top of the screen now, the explosion on the Nord Stream pipeline. And there's also around 100 events uh, at, at coal mines. Now, these super emitting events are obviously garnering a lot of attention also in, in the media. And that's, and that's rightly so. Um, you know, they deserve to be front and center um, if we are serious about cutting methane. But we need to put them into context. So emissions from normal oil and gas operations, including vented, uh, fugitive, and flared emissions uh, from some of the highest emitting countries, they dwarf those from the individual events that we've, those super emitting events that we had on, on the previous slide. So when we think about that Nord Stream explosion and the methane that was, uh, that was leaked uh, as a result, Let's have in mind also that globally, normal oil and gas operations are responsible for more than one Nord Stream size methane event every single day. So efforts to tackle super emitting events must go hand in hand with measures to reduce emissions from regular um, operations. Unfortunately, there's a huge range of different options available to cut down on these emissions. And so our latest assessment, as was mentioned, is that we could cut methane from oil and gas operations by around three quarters using existing uh, technologies. And as the executive director was mentioning, a lot of that is extremely cost effective. Even if we took prices, before, prices for natural gas um, before the global energy crisis, um, around half of the measures that could be used to abate methane leaks in the oil and gas sector could be deployed at, at no uh, net cost. In 2022, obviously around the world, we had much higher uh, gas prices than usual. And if we looked at the different prices that were in play in different parts of the world, that meant that the vast majority of uh, methane emissions uh, could, be, uh, could be captured uh, at no, um, no net cost. So it is the economic drivers are very strong, but we shouldn't over focus on the, on the economics of this because methane is such a potent uh, greenhouse gas, no matter the gas price, or even if the gas has no value at all, tackling methane emissions still has to be a, a top priority. And as the executive director mentioned, um, it won't be a hugely expensive thing to do. Um, just 3% of the um, net income that uh, accrued to the oil and gas industry in 2022 
uh, would be enough to take all of those abatement measures. And it was particularly striking for us to see this wasteful leakage of methane in 2022, given not just the price incentives, but also the energy security um, concerns and, and the need for additional gas uh, to come to market in, in the light of um, the curtailment of Russian uh, deliveries to Europe. So reducing methane leaks and flaring from oil and gas operations could make more than 200 billion cubic metres of gas available to market each year. So that's comparable to the amount that Russia uh, used to export to Europe prior to its invasion uh, of Ukraine. And when you look at the geographical, uh, you know, geographical locations of uh, much of this wasted gas, it's often within relatively close proximity uh, of markets. Um, when it comes to flaring, for example, and um, there's analysis that shows that over half of all flared volumes are within 20 kilometres of an existing gas pipeline. And there are examples, including over the last, uh, over the last year, where new infrastructure was put in place quickly. Um, recently, a dedicated gas pipeline was put in place in less than one year in Egypt uh, to move up to 50 million cubic metres of natural gas per year to an existing gas processing facility uh, rather than flaring it. Before concluding, I'd like to say a few words on coal. I've focused a lot on oil and gas methane emissions um, in this presentation up till now. Um, but let's not forget that there are significant methane emissions also from um, coal operations. So that's around um, 40 million tonnes. So it's similar to the levels of methane emissions, both from the oil sector or, or the gas sector. And indeed, in the world's largest um, coal producer and consumer, which is, is China, you know, these are a significant part of the, of the global footprint. So um, coal-related methane emissions in China, um, in our view, are equivalent to total CO2 emissions uh, from the whole uh, of sub-Saharan Africa. One of the best ways to cut down on these emissions is simply to use uh, less coal. And in general, Tackling methane emissions from coal mines is more challenging than is the case for emissions from oil and gas operations. Um, but there are a number of, op uh, of options available to cut these coal mine methane emissions. Uh, and we feel that these should be very much in the minds uh, of policymakers around the world as well. Um, and what we found in this year's analysis was that existing technologies could cut methane emissions in half. Uh, and an even greater share can be cut at underground coking coal mines. Um, coking coal, as a reminder, is used to produce steel and is generally hard to harder to displace than the steam coal and that's mainly used uh, for, for power generation. So uh, in addition to the numbers that we've provided in the tracker that we're announcing the update of uh, today, um, at the IEA uh, we're also keen to push action and implementation. Um, and some of the work that we did last year was very much focusing not just on the environmental case for methane abatement, which is exceptionally strong, um, but also um, the energy security case uh, for doing the same. And what we've done is we've produced sort of how-to guides for policymakers, so a regulatory roadmap and a policy toolkit on oil and gas, uh, which has become a sort of go-to source for policymakers and regulators looking to develop new and impactful methane regulation. And today uh, we are releasing also a companion piece on coal, on coal mine methane emissions. So what do policymakers need to have in mind uh, when they are taking steps to bring down um, emissions also from, from the coal sector? And finally, um, just to return to um, the good collaboration that we have with a number of different international organizations. I've already mentioned the IMEO, um, there's the World Bank, there's a number of other um, organizations like the Methane Guiding Principles. Um, and we think there's, there's a number of important initiatives already out there um, that can improve transparency on emissions and, and improve emissions management across the uh, fossil fuel industry. Um, but before opening up to your questions, just to return to um, one of our key messages from this work, despite some signs of progress, overall 2022 was a, a disappointing year for efforts to tackle methane emissions, especially given those very strong economic drivers and very strong energy security uh, drivers that should have 
uh, given it a, a big boost. So we can also we can always point to some individual positive signs and and things that are that give us cause for hope. Um, but there is um, so much more to do. And as the executive director said, I mean this is really the entry ticket for oil and gas companies to a meaningful discussion about so solutions uh, to climate change. Um, it's not the whole story, um, as we'll uh, discuss in the in the report that the. Um, that the executive director mentioned that we're preparing for a COP28. But it is such an important starting point for that discussion. And we need to see substantial, verifiable, lasting cuts in methane emissions uh, across the whole energy sector. And with that, um, I'll be uh, very grateful to get any questions and colleagues, uh, together with my colleague, um, Dr. Christoph McGlade, and, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tim, for the presentation and some of the sobering results you've presented. Uh, we're going to take a very quick uh, break so that uh, the journalists on the call can uh, send us their question through the Q&A box, and we'll, we'll be right back uh, for the Q&A part of our session. Thank you. Welcome back. So we have a number of questions uh, which we will uh, dive uh, right into. We'll take two rounds of three. And so the, for the first round of questions, uh, maybe to um, Dr. McGlade. So how can investors put pressure on oil and gas companies to reduce their methane emissions from Mike Thatcher at Net Zero? Investor. And then second question also perhaps to your, you, uh, Christoph. How could countries be pushed to create a global commitment 
to reduce methane emissions from coal mines, as cut in, cutting methane emissions from coal mines is not included in the, in the uh, Global Methane Pledge launched in Glasgow from um, Nuran um, Erdukul, uh, Erdukul from Anadolu, also adding to that, uh, I think, what is the most impactful measure uh, to reduce coal mine methane emissions? And perhaps a third question to yourself, uh, uh, Tim, uh, if this is so cost effective, why are we not seeing this uh, more? So perhaps uh, over to you, Dr. McLeod. Thank you very much, Jad. As the executive director mentioned, this is one of the key questions that we are going to be addressing in the, the upcoming report, looking at um, the role of the oil and gas industry um, towards COP28. But there is a lot that the investors can already be doing um, when um, discussing um, climate change and discussing alignment of oil and gas companies with net zero targets. Alignment is one, understanding what those companies are doing on the ground in terms of their investments, in terms of their investments into new technologies away from traditional operations. But really what is very, very important is that for every single oil and gas company, whether it's an international oil and gas company, a national oil and gas company, a small independent, is that their own emissions are absolutely as low as possible. They need to have this zero tolerance towards methane emissions. Tackling methane emissions is the most important thing that oil and gas companies can do to lower the emissions intensity of their own production. And if we have that pressure coming from investors in ha helping those um, companies um, reduce their emissions, lending to um, projects that will reduce those, um, uh, their own emissions, all of that will help move us on the right path towards getting um, that substantial reduction in the overall emissions intensity of oil and gas production. On the second question on, on the Global Methane Pledge, the Global Methane Pledge is uh, a target for all um, emis methane emissions from human activity. So it covers emissions from the oil and gas sector, it covers emissions from coal, it also covers emissions from bioenergy, as well as agriculture and waste. So it's a target to reduce all of those human-made um, sources of emissions by about 30% by 2030. So it does include emissions coming from the coal sector. And as we set out in this year's tracker, we have looked for the first time at the different technologies and different options that are available to the coal sector. Some of the most impactful things that we see is, first of all, whenever coal mining companies are opening up new areas within coal mines, there's, they need to de-gasify um, those areas before operations can start. And whether that's a surface mine or whether it's an underground coal mine, that can re result in a very highly concentrated source of methane emissions. So they de-gasify those mines. They have a lot of methane um, that, is, that is there. And often they just vent that methane to the atmosphere. But it should be the case that because that methane is so concentrated, it's a cheap source of, of energy or of heat for um, their operation. So capturing that methane, using it for power, using it for heat can be a very effective way to reduce um, emissions from coal mines in a cost effective way. Another important option is in underground mines. Um, as you may be aware, methane will seep out slowly from, from coal seams um, as operations are underway in an underground coal mine. And it's essential for worker safety that those uh, methane emissions don't build up. Um, so they have um, air that's constantly um, rotated around coal mines to ensure that there's no um, risk of explosions. But that ventilation air, as it's called, is, is then often just vented to the atmosphere. And because that contains a bit of methane, that leads to a large level of methane emissions. The methane concentrations in that ventilation air can be quite low, but there are many examples around the world where operators have um, introduced measures, introduced uh, techniques to capture that um, ventilation air methane and then either destroy the methane so that it doesn't um, go straight to the atmosphere or again to use it to help power their operations. So those two things, De using degasification um, uh, methane and using uh, ventilation air methane are two of the most um, effective and cost effective things that operators can do. Maybe I can take the, the question of if this is so cost effective, why is it not happening? Indeed, that's, um, that's a, it's a great question. It's one we often spend some time discussing amongst ourselves here at, uh, at, at DIEA. Uh, and what we 
come back to is that there is an information problem. So often um, a company that is emitting methane is not aware of the level of leaks or it's not aware of the cost effectiveness of the abatement options. So we need to fill that information gap and many of the things we've discussed today, particularly in terms of better monitoring technologies, um, will help to, to, to do that. I think another important issue is that within any company you've got competition for investment capital. So different parts of the company will be proposing different ways for companies to spend their money. Um, and it's sometimes the case that a methane abatement initiative you know, won't get across the hurdle that is, that is uh, there within the company for, 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 for investment. Um, we were discussing this issue actually um, uh, recently um, with the Methane Guiding Principles Group and one of the, in a sense, the solutions that came up is that this, this has to be an issue that's not just about the bottom line. Um, you need to you know, make sure that when companies are taking those investment decisions that you know, the head of sustainability is around the table or that there is due weight given to the reputational risks of a failure to act both for the company itself um, and for the broader um, industry. And there are also cases where um, the entity that needs to invest is not necessarily the one that will benefit from the upside in terms of, of, of getting additional gas to market. So that's often the case uh, when you have um, infrastructure. And in, case, in some cases there is just a lack of infrastructure to get that gas to market. And there you have all sorts of local uses of uh, captured gas, particularly captured flared gas, um, that can be um, quite uh, important uh, there. So we think that you know there are these different categories of reason why stuff doesn't happen, even though it's very cost effective. All of those problems um, can be resolved, uh, and that's some of the things that we're working on together with different partners is to make sure uh, that we that we close those gaps. Great, thank you very much, uh, Tim. Really fascinating, and in fact, just jumping off on something you just said, um, interesting question here about uh, technology and um, how long until satellites and other monitoring technologies can bring full transparency to methane emissions from oil and gas. Uh, this is something that we have in the report, and maybe to tag along maybe a policy response um, in our second round of questions, how important um, in this situation is the passage of the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act? So maybe I'll take the first of these on the satellites and other uh, monitoring technologies. Indeed, this is a very dynamic area and there's all sorts of advances being made, um, both in terms of the number of observations being made and, and, the, and the detail um, that they can uh, reveal. So things are getting more promising, more exciting um, every year. There are still a number of, of blind spots, um, so we are you know, not yet in a, in a position where we have a, a comprehensive view. Um, but initiatives such as the International Methane uh, Emissions Observatory um, are, are, are going to be very, very important um, in that respect. And also um, the, the Methane SAT um, initiative from, from the Environmental Defence Fund is going to help a great deal in improving that uh, transparency. Um, so I think the, the message there is that um, it's, moving, it's moving quickly. Um, it will be increasingly difficult for you know, poorly operated, um, you know, poorly managed operations to hide from the environmental uh, consequences or visibility about the environmental consequences uh, of those operations. Um, so we are going to get much more information about where larger leaks are coming from. But that uncertainty over the data, it's really not an excuse for uh, inaction. We know more than enough um, to make a very strong case uh, for reducing methane leaks uh, from fossil fuel operations. And there are very tried and tested effective solutions that have been proven to work um, in different jurisdictions around the world and in different companies around the world. Um, and that's, um, so in a sense, we shouldn't wait for satellites to provide that last degree of transparency. We know more than enough uh, to make progress with abatement uh, already today. And on the question of the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, really, this is a game changer. Um, it's a game changer for a, a whole host of different reasons um, on clean energy technologies, 
but there's also a, a number of important elements in the Inflation Reduction Act on methane. Um, just to mention a few of these, the first is a, a requirement for oil and gas companies to report their emissions based on empirical and accurate measurements. And this is where, as we've been hearing from, from Mr. Gould, um, satellites will have an important part to play, but also on the ground measurement campaigns will continue to have um, an, a very important aspect to help boost that um, empirical and accurate measurement levels. The second element is on financing. The, the Inflation Reduction Act includes about $1.5 billion in financial and technical assistance to advance quickly methane abatement. And the final element is that there is a new charge that will be introduced at the federal level on methane emissions. It starts at about $900 per tonne um, next year and will then um, increase um, in the years um, thereafter. And that um, methane charge is, is at quite a high level. Um, it really should drive um, action from operators. If we put it into context, Norway has had a charge on methane emissions for a number of years now at a very similar level to what um, is going to be introduced in the United States. And Norway has the lowest emissions intensity of oil and gas production of any country in the world. And um, a large reason for that is because of the methane charge. So there's a huge number of important elements in um, the US Inflation Reduction Act, and we're very much looking forward to seeing how that plays out on the ground. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christoph. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, I would like to thank um, uh, everyone for watching and following us. This is obviously a very important, critical topic, which we will be following uh, um, throughout this year, a particularly important year uh, for this uh, question. Um, I'd like to thank all your teams who contributed to this report. And you can find all the findings, the data, um, all of the analysis behind this on our website at IEA.org. If you have any more questions, please reach out to press at IEA.org. And don't forget to sign up to our newsletter also on the website. Thank you very much.